Let's go ahead and get into this word. Amen. Let's do this together. We do this often. Go ahead and put your hand right in the middle of your chest, and I want you to say this with me. Say one word from the Lord will change my life forever. Say it again. Say one word from the Lord will radically change my life forever. Say, speak, Lord, and I'll be a hearer and a doer of this word. Praise God. Now look at the person next to you and tell them, tell them real plain, be a little bit rude, point at them, say, you need this word. <laughs> look at the person on the other side and say, you need this word. Praise God. Now give them a high five. Give them a high five. Praise God. Glory to God. Now, I want to be very careful. I do not want to just glaze over what happened in this place last Sunday. My God. Woo! God moved mightily in this place, man. We saw every single person that came up uh, to be healed, to receive healing. Every single person left here healed. So can we just for one moment take two minutes and give God praise for what we saw manifested in the house last Sunday? Come on, give him some praise for that. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. All I could do is go home and cry and, and, and thank him for what he has done and doing in this ministry. We never want to lose our awe. We never want to lose our wonder. Amen. So we thank God for what he is doing. Well, let's go ahead and get into this word. Amen. Say this with me. Say reject. Religion. Embrace a relationship with Christ. Say it again with revelation. Say reject. Religion. Embrace. A relationship with Christ. Give God a hand clap for that. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We started this two weeks ago, and we, I wanted to make sure it was you know, vitally clear that I think um, history is important as it pertains to us learning the Word of God. We have to understand what was going on at the time the Word of God was released, amen? So we need a little bit of history so that we understand what God was doing, how he was doing it to give us context of what we see in the Word of God. So we find, uh, we started with Abraham, and of course there's a whole lot we can get into this, but I, I want to start right at Abraham, amen? And so uh, Abraham was not a child of God initially, Abraham was just a regular man, just like everybody else that lived on the earth. And then God started a relationship with Abraham. God intervened and spoke to Abraham. And the word of God tells us that Abraham believed God. Abraham did what God told him to do. Abraham received what God was saying as truth, and he started this relationship with God. In other words, whatever Abraham told God, I mean, excuse me, whatever God told Abraham, he believed and trusted God. In the and that started the relationship. So from the very beginning, we see God wanting to have relationship with man. And it goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Amen. God created Adam and Eve and he fellowshiped with them. But of course, we know what happened in the garden and, and, and man fell away from having this relationship instead of uh, uh, Fostering the relationship and developing in the relationship, we wanted to find another way to be close to God, to be more like God without realizing we were already like him from the beginning. He made us in his image and likeness. And the enemy got involved and tricked us into thinking, watch now, that we needed to do something to be more like him. Let me say that again. The enemy tricked us into believing we needed to do something, that there was an action that we needed to take that would make us more like God. How much closer can you get to God than we were already close to him? But the enemy tricked Adam and Eve into believing you need to do something else. There's a piece of God that we have not tapped into yet, and if you do this... 
you'll be more like him. But we were already like him, amen? Made in his image and likeness. And so we, you, you, the history of Adam and Eve, and then we find Abraham listening and obeying to God, amen? And then from Abraham all the way to Moses, I told you a couple weeks ago that the time between there, and I know oftentimes we don't realize just how much time had lapsed, between Abraham and Moses was either between 400 to 1,000 years. Look at somebody and say, that's a long time. 400 to 1,000 years between Abraham and Moses. And in between that time, Abraham was told by God that he would be a father of many nations. And then out of Abraham's loins came an entire group of people. And this group of people had, you know, filled the earth between 400 to 1,000 years. So that's why today when we talk about being a son of Abraham, it's because we come out of that same lineage that God promised Abraham. And anyone who believes God is a son of Abraham. And the reason this Jewish religion or the Hebrew religion even was made was specifically because those were the individuals that believed God. So out of Abraham... A thousand years later was a whole nation of people whose job or whose responsibility was to believe God, to have a relationship with God. But just as man always does, we don't keep our end of the bargain. God always keeps his end of the bargain. We don't keep our end of the bargain. God did exactly what he promised Abraham, but the people, the children that came from the loins of Abraham, they wanted to do their own thing. And there were Hebrews during this time, people that believed God, the Jewish nation, but then there were many other types of individuals and many other types of religions. And the children of Israel, as the word says, it played the harlot. What we did is, you know, we, <laughs> and when we talk about playing the harlot, I'll put it like this. You know, any time you are intimate to receive something, that's called prostitution. Let me say that again. Any time you are only intimate to receive something, that's called prostitution. And the word of God says very plainly is that the children of Israel played the harlot. We would come close to God to receive something from God when we needed him to show up and show out in our lives. But any other time, we wanted to do anything we wanted to do whenever we saw fit. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Uh, uh, look at somebody and say, don't act like a hoe. I'm sorry. I just had to say it. I could not say it. I could not say it. Look at the person on the other side. Please tell them, say, don't act like a hoe. It's in a word. I didn't make it up. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. That's the key. We are not to prostitute God. But the children of Israel did just that. They would lay with other gods. They would be intimate with other ways of thinking and other religions instead of following God. So because of that, the children of Israel were put into slavery. They were put into slavery by the Egyptians because we didn't want to do what God wanted us to do. It caused us to be locked up in slavery. Now, if you look at your own life, you can see the very same thing. Every time you personally fall out of relationship with God, you ended up a slave to something else. Mm. Children of Israel were in slavery, and they were in slavery for somewhere between 400, they say, the, the, theologians, they argue back and forth, but we know for a fact it was at least 400 plus years of slavery. Some say about 430, some say longer than that. Some again say between 400 to 1,000 years in slavery, but at least 400 years locked up in slavery. And God, in all of his mercy, the children of Israel are crying out for a savior. They're crying out to be delivered. They're crying out, God, forgive us, forgive us, forgive us. For 400 years, God sends a deliverer. God sends Moses. Moses comes along and he sets the captives free. The children of Israel, not only are they free, they also take all of the spoils from Egypt, and then they are going to a promised land, the place that God wants to be their God. A place where God says, we're going to take you out of your slavery because of the mistakes that you've made. 
Number one, the main mistake is that you decided to make me a religion instead of have relationship with me. They, he takes them out of Egypt. They take spoils with them. They take goods. They, they literally rob Egypt blind, and they are on the way to their promised land. On the way there, God delivers them from the Egyptian army. Swallows up the Egyptian army in the Red Sea. They don't have any food. They have no shelter. God is a cloud by day and a fire by night. Whatever they need, God shows up. He literally gives them manna, and the word manna means bread from heaven. Mysterious bread showed up, and they were able to feed themselves. So anything that they needed, this God that decided to... Uh, reintroduce himself to them, showed up and said, this is who I am. God told Moses, I am. He says, who do you call me? Oh, my God. See, that's the, that's the key. We call him God, but he called himself, I am. We give him a name. He's too great for just one name. My God. Because whatever you need him to be, that's what he is. And if you're not careful, you'll religiousize the name God and see him as a man upstairs somewhere with a white beard and a lightning bolt waiting to zap you every time you do something wrong. Who is he? I am. What you need me to be? I'll be your mama. I'll be your daddy. I'll be your friend. I'll be your provider. I'll be Jehovah Jireh. I'll be Jehovah Sitkanu. Come on. I'll be Jehovah Shalom. Whatever you need me to be, that's who I am. And that is what the children of Israel begin to realize. And that's where all the names of God comes from. He is the one that does this. He's the one that does that. He's the one that does this. That's who God is. Whatever you need him to be. That is who he'll be to you. He wants to be closer to you than, he, than, than your own breath. That's his desire. Children of Israel didn't want that. They didn't understand that. As a matter of fact, they complained and wanted to go back to Egypt. How you been crying for 400 years to be set free, and then now that you're set free, you want to go back into slavery you've been complaining about for 400 years? Somebody say, that's stupid. Come on, say it again. That's stupid. That's exactly what it is. Stupid. <laughs> Cloud by day, fire by night, protecting them from the wilds of the wilderness, and, all, and because of their disobedience and their ignorance, they took a two-week trip and made it into 40 years. Moses goes and talks to God. God speaks to Moses face to face. Moses comes back and tells the people exactly what God is saying. The people tell Moses, listen, what we would like you to do is continue your relationship with God. We don't want to have an actual intimate relationship with him. You go talk to him, tell us what he says, and you come back and explain to us what he wants. Watch now. And when you come back to explain to us what he wants, we'll do what he tells us to do. In other words, God wants to be their father tells them, I want to be your father. I want to have relationship with you. The children of Israel say, whoa, too much, too close. we rather you talk to your representative, Moses. As you talk to your representative, let him come tell us what you want, and then we'll do what he says. In other words, the children of Israel wanted a middleman. They wanted a priest. They wanted a go-between, but God wanted koinonia. God wanted to speak to them face to face the same way they sp he spoke to Moses face to face. But we weren't ready for that. And I say we because I'm going to tell you right now. Reality is, is if we really understand this, we'll realize that we are not much different than those people then. We want to go between. You tell us what God is saying. 
For me to spend time with God and intimate time with him, it takes too much time out of my life. I got too much going on. I got a job. I got a children. I got a wife. I got all this stuff. <laughs> you, let me just go to church on Sunday morning. Whatever the pastor say do, that's what I'll do. Mm. Somebody say, help us, Jesus. Somebody say, help us, Jesus. Praise God. Hallelujah. So the children of Israel... They want Moses to direct them. They want Moses to tell them what to do. In other words, they needed rules rather than relationship. They literally were asking for rules. They wanted regulation rather than relationship. So God gave them exactly what they asked for. The Ten Commandments. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. And those commandments were rules to live by. Now, how many know when God gives a rule, it's not that the rule is bad. It's just that as when those rules come to mankind because of our heart and our desire, we took the rules that God gave and made it into a religion. Goes back to the very beginning of Adam and Eve. Religion says this, let me see what I can do to get God to do something for me. That's what we wanted. I'll keep these rules so well, God will show up in my life. I'll keep them so good, or maybe what I'll do is don't let nobody else know that I'm breaking all of them. So at least in front of people, it'll look like I'm doing so well. But how many know that... (laughs) Whether you realize it or not, God sees you no matter what you're doing. And the reality is these Ten Commandments, every single person in this room has broken every single one of those commandments at least once in your life. So the reality is the Ten Commandments were not set up to regulate the people of God. It was to show them that they could not keep these laws, these commands, these rules without an actual relationship. The rules, the laws, the regulations are powerless. They don't make you right with God. They don't put you in a right relationship with God. As a matter of fact, you can't even keep these rules. Don't lie. Don't steal. I was talking to my kids the other day, and (laughs) we were all sitting in the room, and one of my kids said, you know, I ain't never stole nothing in my life. And everybody else in the room was like, well, I don't know I we all stole something before. And I said, well, you know, you, 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 you proud you ain't stolen? Yeah, I ain't never stole nothing. I said, but have you lied before? <laughs> we all fall short. Every single one of us falls short of the glory of God. And these rules and our meticulous trying to, you know, line up to these rules. Now, the rules aren't bad. But you thinking keeping them makes you right is wrong. Uh, So now we started out with Ten Commandments. Moses releases the Ten Commandments. Now between the time of Moses and Jesus, the Old Testament, Moses to Jesus, there are 1,600 years. Again, we talked. We said it the other day. Look at the person next to you and say, I did not know that. Don't tell the truth and shame the devil. Say, I did not know that. 1,600 years. And then between the Old Testament and the New Testament is, is another 400 years where there were no prophetic words. God did not speak to man at all. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm just going to par- paraphrase it for myself the way I see it. It is as if God had got so sick and tired of man doing their own thing. He just decided, I ain't saying nothing else. I don't want to talk to them. <laughs> I don't want to talk to them. 400 years, the heavens were closed. No prophetic words. And this is the intertestamental time, it's called. Intertestamental period. The time between the Old Testament and the New Testament. 400 years of silence from heaven. No prophetic words. God ain't saying nothing. Then enters Jesus. Now, you have to understand that during this period, this 1600 year period 
the Hebrew nation was invaded many times. And throughout these times of being invaded, they were invaded by other countries that were more powerful than them. And when they were invaded, the people that invaded them, whatever nation it was, not only did they bring about their rule, their governmental systems, their culture, but they also brought in their religions. The Greeks invaded the Hebrew nation. Many people don't know this. The Greeks invaded the Hebrew nation and their entire form of punishment, their entire uh, 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 MO in order to subdue the Jewish people was to literally obliterate their religion as they followed God. That was their MO. We're going to come in and we're going to completely obliterate them following God. We're going to introduce gods. That's where Zeus came from. Hercules and, you know, Aphrodite and, 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 and all of these other gods, the gods of war and all of these. The Greeks introduced many gods. And so if we're not careful, we will make the mistake of not realizing that as by the time of Jesus, you got the Greeks. And then after the Greeks was the Romans, and they have their own religions that they're introducing. So what happens is there's a, there's a period, I'm probably um, pronouncing it incorrectly, it's called the Maccabean, or Maccabean or something. One of y'all historians, y'all know. The Maccabean time or era is where there was a, a revolt. The, the people of Israel decided we're going to revolt, we're going to fight back, we're going to take our country back from the Greeks. And so then what raised up out of that was people who began to exercise their religion and feel proud and, and, and you know, a, a, a sense of pride for going back to the old way. Now, when you get to the New Testament, there are two major antagonists to Jesus. The Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees were ones that decided, um, you know, we're going to pick up the old ways. We're going to do things the old way. And there were certain things they believed, and they were fighting against that Greek rule, the Roman rule. The Sadducees were the individuals who were in agreement with the political uh, arena. They were your rich people, your landowners, the individuals who had money. They were more interested in aligning themselves with political parties. That's, that's who the Sadducees were. Both of them were both religious zealots, and the reality is, is that they hated each other. They fought constantly, Pharisees and Sadducees. See, we say Pharisees and Sadducees like they was the same people. No, they're two different sects of religious zealots, both believing different things. And I want to make it a little bit more clearer. The Sadducees were an upper class party of high priests. Let me say that again. Pharisees were not priests. See, you ain't know that. Tell the truth, shame the devil. You didn't know that. The Pharisees were not priests. The Sadducees were the high priests, and they, you know, revolved around the temple. They were marked as individuals who would go into the temple and begin to, you know, put uh, 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 sacrifices for the people of God. That was their job. They were the upper class party, the rich people, the aristocrats, the merchants, the wealthier population. They were a traditional ruling class of priests. And the way that they believed is this. Listen carefully. That if it was not in the written law, if it wasn't in the Ten Commandments, then it did not exist. And so what they did was create, as I said previously, more commandments. At this time now, there are 613 commandments. As a matter of fact, if you lived in a particular area, a, a particular region, the high priest, the Sadducee of that area could make a decision to add more commandments based upon the region he lived in. He was in such a place, a upper echelon, that he dictated a, a political choosing, that he dictated who was in government. He was rich. He had money. The Sadducees. Then you have your Pharisees. 
Now, again, you keep, we always hear about the Pharisees, the Pharisees, the Pharisees. Well, the thing, the reason why we hear about them more is because Jesus encountered the Pharisees on a regular basis. You see, the Pharisees was your normal, everyday person. Although he did have a little bit more money than the average person, he was like your small landowner. He was also very religious, right? And well, but here's the thing, very well respected. You see, because the Pharisee, oh man, please hear me this morning. Understand where we're going. The Pharisee saw himself more down the earth than the Sadducee. Now, to us, he's an antagonist to Jesus. But the Pharisee saw himself as modern, forward-thinking, less religious than the Sadducee. They believed the same thing, but the Pharisees also believed that you could be resurrected from the dead. The Pharisee also believed that there were certain things that, that, that me and you could, could hear from God. And as we heard from God, we could interpret the scriptures from God. The Sadducee believed that God don't speak to nobody. The Sadducee believed that there was no resurrection. And so there was a fight between these two, a more modern thinking Jew and a rigid, rich, upper class Jew. Pharisee was not rich most, most times, didn't have more money. He saw himself as forward-thinking, modern, down-to-earth, and everyone respected them because he could say, I'm not like the Sadducee. Mm. He could point fingers and say, I'm not that rigid bunch who lords things over you. I'm not like them. A Pharisee was not allowed to bring sacrifices into the temple. He would meet in the synagogue. Oh, come on now. So his pride was that the majority of the Pharisees were also built up with scribes or lawyers. So the lawyers, the legalism type people. So what he would do, he would join himself with the scribes and he prided himself in knowing all the laws. So when Jesus, oftentimes you see Jesus going toe to toe, he's going toe to toe with the Pharisee because the Pharisee is watching Jesus manifest the kingdom. And what the Pharisee is saying, that's not legal. The Pharisee is reminding Jesus of the religion and trying to hold court in the marketplace or in the synagogue and to remind Jesus, you're not following the law. I pride myself in knowing the law. Now, when we say the law, I want you to realize something. We, we're talking about what was considered at that time the Bible. The law was the Bible. There was no Bible. And so basically what the Pharisee was saying is, I know my word. I know my word. And what you're doing right now is not in the word. Somebody say amen. Somebody say help us, Jesus. They taught the way to God was by obeying the law. That was the way to God. The Pharisee changed Judaism uh, from a religion of sacrifice that was done in the temple to one of keeping the commands. Let me say that again. The Pharisee taught, you don't necessarily need to go to the temple to make a sacrifice. All you need to do is keep the commands. So it brought this relationship of sacrifice in the temple where the Sadducees ruled. Oh, come on, somebody. See, it's a, it's a political struggle. Forget them over there. You bring all your stuff to them, and we can't get it. Oh. If you bring all your sacrifices to the Sadducee, they can take some of the sacrifice, and that'll make them rich and wealthy. But, but, but it's... It's not helping us none. So, so forget going to them. Just, just follow the laws. Listen to us. And, and, and we'll raise our sphere of influence. And you do what we tell you to do instead. Power struggle. 
They would fight all the time. Even to the point of it become, be, becoming physical. They were at odds with each other. But how many know Jesus challenged it all? He challenged every bit of it. Praise God. Hallelujah. Both rigid hated each other. Two different sects. Now, when you hear this, it is so easy to make yourself believe that we are not like any one of them. But I challenge you to think and to realize that as children of God in Christendom in this day and age, we're more like them than we realize. We are more like them than we realize. You got a, a group of individuals who are more religious than another group of individuals. And these individuals claim that they're not religious, but nevertheless, they're just as religious, just in a different way. We pride ourselves of being evangelical and, and doing the will of God, but we've made the mistake of aligning ourselves with a political party, and whatever that political party says, that the political party has become our religion. Oh, boy. And then there's those of us that have made the decision that we are not like them at all, and then non-denomination has become a denomination. Somebody say, help us, Jesus. It's not about your denomination. It is not about your uh, political affiliation. It is about the kingdom of God. I think right there you need to give God a shout. Right there, right there, right there. Praise God. Hallelujah. It is easy to fall into ritualistic, traditional ways of doing things. I told you before, religion is us trying to get God to do something. We do things to get him to do something. And then if he, if we're not careful, we will take note of how he showed up before, and then we'll try to recreate that occurrence again by doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over, looking for the same result. How many know the word of God says this? The true sons of God are those that are led by the spirit of God. If I want to manifest or really stand up in my true identity as a son or a daughter of God, then I have got to be led by the spirit of God. God is an innovator. He is always doing what he want to do when he want to do it. And every time he do it, we call it the new thing. But how many know is just God being God? He has the right to choose to change situations, change his MO, change methods, change programs. Whenever he sees fit, he's God. It was an old song back in the day. God don't need no matches. He filed by himself. <laughs> God don't need no matches. He is fire all by himself. And the reality is he come to burn up everything you think he is and he ain't. He comes to burn up our tradition. He comes to burn up our religion. Why? So that we'll come out as pure gold. Hallelujah. You better give God a hand clap in this place. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. He's so good. We cannot fall into following our own routine of worship. A routine of how we come to him and how we minister to him the way that we want. We got to give him what he's asking for. Praise God. Hallelujah. If we follow a routine and do not live a life of worship and surrender, we have minimized our relationship with God to a transactional agreement. A contract. God, you do this and I'll do that. God, I'll do this, and then I need you to do that. And I, 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 I gave this analogy last week. It has always been about the walk. You know, when you ask your girlfriend or your boyfriend or your husband or your wife or your kid, you say, hey, let's go take a walk. How many know you're going to leave the house and end up back at the house? So it was not about a destination at all. You're going to go and come back to the same place. 
The walk is about walking together, spending time together, ministering to one another, serving and loving on each other. If we just take a walk and ain't nobody talking, that ain't, man, I don't want to do that walk. I want to take a walk with you. Hold my hand. Let's go to this point, but the key is we're not trying to get to a destination. It's about the intimacy that we share on the walk. Somebody say amen. Amen. It's all about the walk. We are walking with God. We are walking with Christ Jesus, and we're called to take his hand and let him lead us. It's always been about the walk. It's always been about the intimacy. Praise God. Ah, let's turn to Matthew 5 and 17. Matthew 5 and 17 says this. This is Jesus, and he says this. If you think I've come to set aside the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets, you're mistaken. Oh, wait a minute. I thought we was religion reject. No, I said we religion rejects. How many know anything that God says is good? How many know don't kill somebody is good? How about don't lie? That's good. Treat others as you want to be treated. All of those things are good. So this is not a a, a series about religion. If I reject it, then I am also saying that I accept relationship. That's like me having a, 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 a message or, or, or a strike against the boogeyman. The boogeyman is mad made. He don't exist. It's a fallacy. So what sense does it make me having a strike against the boogeyman? Powerless. Religion is powerless. It, it can't scare me. It don't scare nobody. It can't do nothing. It's fake. It doesn't exist, especially in the kingdom of God. Now, if you're operating in religion or if you're scared of the boogeyman, you got a problem. (laughs) Hallelujah. God did not. Jesus did not come to abolish the law. It says he has come to fulfill it. To bring perfection all that has been written. In other words, when Jesus showed up, he shows us the reason why the law makes sense. He shows us why you shouldn't kill somebody else. He shows us why you should love others as you love yourself. He gives us the reason behind it. Why? Because he's in right standing with the Father, and he very plainly told us in the Word, I don't do nothing that I don't first see my Father do. I don't say nothing that I don't first see my Father say. What is Jesus? He is the manifestation of a man. In an earth suit, following and surrendering to the will of God. He's in right relationship with his daddy. And because he's in right relationship, the law is nothing to follow. It's simple. Why would I not do what God wants me to do? And in the New Testament, it tells me very plainly, if I love like Jesus loved, I complete every single law. If I'm in right relationship with God, do I got to tell you don't sleep with your neighbor's wife? If you're in love with God, you ain't going to sleep with them. <laughs> Leave that man wife alone. Do I got to tell you don't kill your brother? No, I don't got to tell you that. Why? Because you're in love with God and all you want to do is what God is directing you to do. Fall in love with him. Praise God. Hebrew 10 and 1. This is a passion translation. It says the old system of living under the law presented us only a faint shadow, a crude outline of the reality of the wonderful blessing to come. Even with its steady stream of sacrifices offered year after year, there was nothing that could make our hearts perfect before God. No matter what you do, 
No matter how you are trying to follow the customs and the traditions of those that came before you, none of it is going to make you right before the Father. I don't care what you do, what you say. You could pray a million times. And when I say pray, I'm not talking about actual communication. I'm talking about you can religiously, traditionally offer up your traditional prayers in a manner that does not communicate with the Father. You could fast. You could wear dresses all the way down to your ankle. <laughs> you, you can make a decision not to wear no makeup. You can do all of these traditional, ritualistic, uh, religious things. And none of them are going to make you right before God it's called righteousness when I'm right no 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 righteousness means you are in right standing with the father the word of God tells you to be holy because he's holy you ain't holy well I'm living holy are you really that declaration alone says that you are better than someone else oh you already done said you better than I'm holy I'm holy no he's holy and because he's holy and you're in right relationship with him, you become holy. He makes you holy. Your dress didn't make you holy. What you eat or drink didn't make you holy. What you don't eat or drink don't make you holy either. Mm. Pastor, I don't think you... <laughs> I've been doing this for years. I've been saved, sanctified, and full with the Holy Ghost for umpteen years. And you t No, I know good and well I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't chew, and I don't hang with those that do. I am holy before the Lord. Let's go to the Word of God. Is that all right? Hallelujah. Matthew 23 and 1. Now, please follow with me. It always amazes me how we always pick out certain things in the word of God that we like to preach and we like to hear preach. But when it get down to some of that stuff that make you, you know, question your theology and, and makes you, you know, kind of cringe a little bit, we, we get up off of that stuff. Yeah. Matthew <laughs> 23 and 1. Jesus addresses the crowd and his disciples. And he says this, the religious scholars and the Pharisees sit in Moses' throne as the authorized interpreters of the law. He said, so listen and follow what they teach, but don't do what they do. They ain't teaching wrong. But please don't do what they do. For they tell you one thing and they do a whole nother. They tie on their they tie on your backs an oppressive burden of religious obligations and insist that you carry it out, but will never lift a finger to help or ease your load. Everything they do is done for show and to be noticed by others. They want to be seen as holy. Oh boy. Some, <laughs> somebody say ouch. Ouch. They want to be seen as holy. Watch what he says now. Mind you, this is Jesus. So they wear oversized prayer boxes on their arms and their foreheads with the scriptures inside. And they wear extra long tassels on their outer garment. Oh, my God. They crave the seats of the highest honor at banquets and in their meeting places. And how they love to be admired by men with their titles of respect, aspiring to be recognized in public and have others call them reverend. Help us, Jesus! This is the word. I didn't make none of this up. Somebody say reject religion and embrace a relationship with Christ Jesus. Woo! I heard somebody say it's tight, but it's right. My God. It says, but you point at the person next to you and say, I'm talking about you. Jesus said, but you. No, no, no. We're not talking about you. We're not talking about those in the kingdom. Or are we? We're not 
Jesus is explaining, wait, 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 wait. You not like them. That's not what I came to manifest. I wonder, why does it seem like what I just read is exactly what we see in the quote-unquote kingdom of God? Why is that? If 2,000 years ago he came to reject it, how come we done fell back into it? But you are different from that. You are not to be called master, for you only have one master. And you are all brothers and sisters. Look at the person next to you and tell them, say, I'm your brother, I'm your sister. Come on, man. (laughs) And you are not, oh boy. How many believe what Jesus say is truth? Come on, raise your hand. Let's try this again. How many believe what Jesus say is truth? Okay, praise God. Listen to what he says next. And you are not to be as dressed as father. You are not to be addressed as father. For you only have one father. And he's in heaven. Nor are you to be addressed as teacher, for you have one teacher, the anointed one. And the greatest among you is the one who always serves the others from the heart. Remember this, if you have a lofty opinion of yourself and seek to be honored, you'll be humbled, my God. But if you have a modest opinion of yourself and choose to humble yourself... You will be honored. Listen. Now, in this passage of Scripture, he's addressing those who would consider themselves in a lofty position. And he says this, great sorrow awaits you religious scholars and you Pharisees, frauds, pretenders. You do all to keep people from experiencing the reality of heaven's kingdom realm. Not only do you refuse to enter in it, you also forbid anyone else from entering in it. Great sorrow awaits you, religious scholars, and you Pharisees, you frauds, you pretenders, for you eat up the widow's household with the ladle of your prayers. Because of this, you receive a greater judgment. Great sorrow awaits you, you Pharisees, you frauds, you pretenders, for you will travel over lake and land to find one disciple only to make him twice the child as hell as you are. Whoa. Jesus is calling those who are more interested in religion than relationship a child of hell. You blind guides, great sorrow awaits you. For you teach that there's nothing binding you when you swear by God's temple. But if you swear by the gold of the temple, are you bound by your oath? You are deceived in your blindness. Which is greater, the gold in the temple that makes the gold, the gold in the temple or the thing that makes the gold sacred? And you say whoever takes an oath by swearing by the altar, it's nothing. But if you swear by the gift upon the altar, then you're obligated to keep the oath. What deception! For what is greater, the gift on the altar that makes the gift sacred? Whoever swears by the altar swears and everything offered on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it and the and one who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by God who sits on it. Great sorrow awaits you, you religious scholars and you Pharisees. You frauds, you pretenders, for you are obsessed with the peripheral issues like insisting on paying meticulous tithes on the smallest herbs that grow in a person's garden. Oh, my God. Who's talking here? Jesus. This is Jesus. Let's go to Colossians 2 and 16. Matter of fact, no, let's let's stay right here. Let's stay right here. Let's stay right here. Oh, my God. It says you pay meticulous time on the smallest herb that grow in your garden. These matters are fine. 
yet you ignore the more important duty of all to walk in the love of God, to display mercy to others, and to live with integrity. It says, readjust your values and place first things first. What blind gods, nitpickers, you'll spoon out a gnat from your drink, yet at the same time, you've gulped down a camel without realizing it. <laughs> My God. It says, you great, great sorrow awaits you, religious scholars, you Pharisees. You're like one who will wipe clean the outside of a cup or a bowl, leaving the inside filthy. You are foolish to ignore the greed and self indulgence that live like germs within you. You are blind. You're deaf to your evil. Shouldn't the one who cleans out all, all, clean the outside also be concerned with cleaning the inside? You need to have more than clean dishes. You need to have a clean heart. Pharisees, you frauds, you imposters. You are nothing more than tombs painted with a fresh coat of white paint. Tombs that look shining and beautiful on the outside, but within you are found decaying corpses full of nothing but corruption. Outwardly, you masquerade as righteous people, but inside your hearts are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness, my God. Somebody say, God, forgive us. I, I refuse to be a Pharisee. And don't you know the Pharisees didn't know they was Pharisee. They didn't know that, you know, this is the way they thought. They thought they were forward thinking. They thought they were, you know, uh, 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 more modern than the Sadducees. I'm better. And the word of God tells Jesus, said, look, you, unless you are better than them, and do what I've called you to do, unless you are in right relationship, unless you are listening to what I'm telling you to do, you're going to miss it just like them. Ah, God. As I said before, this is Jesus. It's not my opinion. Directly going after religion, directly speaking to religion. And there's so much more. I encourage you to read Matthew 23. But we got to go on. Amen. Let's go to Colossians 2 and 16. Colossians 2 and 16, it says, so, somebody say so, that means with this being in consideration, so why would you allow anyone to judge you because of what you eat, because of what you drink, or insist that you keep feasts, observe new moon celebrations, or the Sabbath? All of these were prophetic shadows and the evidence of what will be fulfilled for the body is now Christ. In other words, all of these religious obligations as it pertains to traditions and, and, and the way that they saw things at that time. Peter, Paul is saying right here, all of that stuff is unimportant as it pertains to who Christ is in you, in your relationship with the Father. It says, do not let anyone disqualify you from your prize. Look at the person next to you and tell them, say, I love you, but you can't disqualify me. I'm going to receive my prize. Look at the person on the other side and say, I love you, but you can't disqualify me. I'm going to receive my prize. Give God some praise for that. <laughs> It says, don't let their pretended sincerity fool you as they deliberately lead you into their initiation of angel worship. For they take pleasure in pretending to be experts of something they know nothing about. Their reason is meaningless and comes only from their own opinion. They refuse to take hold of the true source. It says, but we. Say this, say, but me. Say, but I. It says, but we receive directly from him. My God. It says, don't let nobody disqualify you. You're going to get your prize. 
And then he said, don't let other individuals who put this pressure, religious pressure on you, pretend that their sincerity is, is going to lead you astray. It says, don't listen to them. It says, but you, but we receive directly from him and his life supplies, his vitality into every part of his body through the joining ligaments connecting us all as one. Somebody put that one up all over the room. Put your one up. Say as one. Say as one. It says he is the divine head who guides his body and causes it to grow by the supernatural power of God. We are one and we're joined together by God. What, what, is, what is Paul explaining here? Forget about all these religious rules, the observation of all this traditional stuff, the stuff that we think is important. What he's saying is what's the most important is for us to be aligned and joined together as one with Christ being the head and Holy Spirit guiding us all to grow by the supernatural power of God. Hallelujah. It says, for we are included in the death of Christ. And have died with him to all of the religious systems and powers of this world. Do not retreat back into being bullied by the standards and the opinions of religion. You didn't hear me. This is Colossians 2 and 20. It says, for you were included in the death of Christ. And have died with him to the religious systems and the powers of this world. Wait a minute. I thought with Jesus, I died to the power of sin and death. Paul is saying, yeah, sin, death, and religion. <laughs> Paul said, yeah, you died to sin and death. That was already obvious. You saved, sanctified, and full with the Holy Ghost. You get it now. He said, but also, Paul is letting you know, right along with that, Jesus died so that you can be free from religious systems. If that ain't powerful, I don't know what is. Do you know that religion has probably killed the same amount of people as sin? Oh, thank you, Lord says you're included in the death of Christ and have died with him to the religious system and powers of this world. Do not retreat back to being bullied by the standards and the opinions of religion. For example, this is what I love about Paul. He said, just in case you don't understand what I'm saying, I'm going to give you an example. For example, he says, the strict requirements of you can't associate with that person or don't eat that or you can't touch that. These are the doctrines of men and corrupt customs that are worthless to help you in your spirituality. For though they may appear to possess the promise of wisdom in their submission to God through the deprivation of their physical bodies, it is actually nothing more than empty rules rooted in religious rituals. Wow. I don't smoke. I don't chew. I don't hang with those that do. Sounded good, but guess what? That is religion. It, is, it does nothing to bring you closer to God. Nothing. Why do you think they called Jesus a wine bibber? Why do you think they spoke about Jesus so negatively? Because he realized in order to save people, you might have to go where other people think you shouldn't go. In order to tell people about the goodness of God, the people that don't know about the goodness of God, you might be in a place that religion says you shouldn't be. You might talk to people that religion say you shouldn't deal with. But it was never supposed to be about a religion. It's always supposed to be about our relationship with the Father. 
I encourage you, if you are in this house of God today, go back and read it for yourself. Read Matthew chapter 23. Go back and read Colossians 2, and you'll find what Jesus is saying is, I mean, Paul, Jesus and Paul are saying is clear. Religion wants to control us. Religion is a power, a false power, and the only power it has is control. Religion is about two things, money and control. If I can control you and keep you from launching out and, and seeing other people and dealing with other people that are not like you, guess what? I can make you feel bad about who you are, and that's easy to get your money. Mm. Pastor Lonnie, you don't step on some tall cotton. Powerless. I'm going to read this and we're done. Colossians, once again, 2 and 20. It says, for you were included in the death of Christ and have died with him to the religious system and powers of this world. You have been included in the death of Christ, the death and the resurrection of Christ, and you have died with him to the religious systems and the powers of this world. Do not retreat back to being bullied by the standards and the opinions of religion. For example, the strict requirements of religion that say you can't associate with those type of people. The strict requirements of religion that say don't eat that, don't drink that, you can't touch that. These are the doctrines of men, not the doctrine of God. This is stuff that man done came up with. And what's amazing is this. This is 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, Paul is trying to tell you, be free. And now here we are. We did just what he said. He said, don't fall back into being bullied. Don't go back into being bullied. He said it 2,000 years ago. Look at the person next to you and say, don't go back to being bullied. Say, please don't go back to being bullied. 21st verse again, it says, for example, the strict requirements, you can't associate with that person or don't eat that or you can't touch that. These are the doctrines of men and corrupt customs that are worthless to help you in your spirituality. For they may appear to possess the promise of wisdom in their submission to God through their deprivation of their physical bodies. It is actually nothing more than empty rules rooted in in religious rituals. I want you to do this. Come on, stand to your feet. Stand up to your feet. And I want you to do this. I just want you to, just as we're standing here, I want you to literally look to see this in your hand as religion. Amen? And again, keep in mind, well, you, I ain't religious. No, I ain't religious. I ain't like that. Trust me. I don't care who you are. There's a root, a little bit of religion somewhere in you. And I want you just to close your eyes. Don't look at anybody. And I want you to take this like there's a, 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 a board in your hand. And on the count of three, I want you just to break that thing. Are you ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. Break it in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Come on, do it again. Come on, do it again. Come on, do it again. On the count of three. One, two, three. Break it in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Last time. Come on, do it again. Do it again. And at this time, I want you to lift up a shout to the Lord. Are you ready? One, two, three. Broken in the name of Jesus. We break every religious tie and stronghold. Now in the name of Jesus. Every lie of the enemy. Every ritualistic custom aligned and made up by some man, we break it in the name of Jesus. We render you powerless in Jesus' name. And we receive a relationship, a right relationship with Christ Jesus. Come on, lift your hand all over this room right now. Lift your hand, lift your hands, lift your hands. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. We're in relationship. Listen, you're in relationship. With the creator of heaven and earth, 
Are you kidding me? You think God is sitting down talking about this trivial stuff? You think God is interested in this trivial things? The word of God tells us 2,000 years ago, you might make yourself feel good by depriving yourself of something, but that ain't got nothing. It's not furthering you in your spirituality. You deprive yourself of this and that, and guess what? You still in the same place, mad, busted and disgusted, frustrated. Meanwhile, <laughs> somebody else that you pointing fingers at, that you telling yourself you better than them, or you doing more than them, or you doing better than them, they living, they just fine, enjoying life. While you patting yourself on the back because you're keeping some religious strict requirement that ain't nobody putting on you except religion. Oh, my God. Somebody say, help us, Jesus. But listen, listen, this is by no means. You know something? You know what's amazing about freedom? It's free. So whatever's in your heart, guess what you're going to do? You're going to do it anyway. Whatever you free to do, you're going to do. Does that mean freedom is not free? When we were bound in slavery as African Americans, we in slavery, and you couldn't do what you want. So now... You free, so now you go get strung out on drugs and go kill somebody. Is, so should we put you back in slavery because you want to kill people? No, slavery is wrong and killing people is wrong too. Problem is, it's a problem down on the inside of you. So for some odd reason, if you're listening to this message and you're hearing reject religion and reject strict requirements and now you want to run off and act a fool, guess what? You was already a fool. You was already not following the leading of the Holy Spirit. So now if we break religion off of you and you decide that you just want to go do what you want, that proves that you wasn't following him in the first place. What I'm telling you is that you should have a right relationship with God. You should have a relationship with the Father. Your religion ain't keeping you from relationship. I mean, excuse me, your, 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 your adherence to these strict rules is not the thing that's calling you into relationship. We're called to be one with him, koinonia with him, in life union, my God. Life union, that means what flows through him is flowing through me, amen? What's flowing through my vein, what flows through his veins is flowing through my veins. The Bible tells me the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is down on the inside of me, and that same power will keep me from walking in sin if I wanted to. If I wanted to. Oh, well, Pastor Lonnie has given us the right to do whatever we want. Exactly. I am. Because Jesus gave you that right. God gave you that right from the beginning of heaven and earth to do whatever you want. You got the right to do whatever you want. Look at somebody and just tell them, say, I can do what I want to do. Look at somebody else and say, I don't care what you say, I can do what I want to do. Now, the question is, if you are submitted as a son and a daughter of the Most High God, will you do what God tells you to do? That is the conundrum of your life. Will you do what God tells you to do? That's the key. Those that are led by the Spirit of God, those are the only ones that are the sons of God. Those that are led by religion... You ain't a son of God. You can try to make yourself feel like it. You can have piety and all this deprivation and all these requirements, but that don't make you a son of God. It's only those that are led by the Spirit of God that are the sons of God. Ah, oh boy. Come on, lift your hands again in this place. Say, lead me, Holy Spirit. Come on, say, lead me, Holy Spirit. Can't lead you unless you choose to walk. He can't lead you unless you open up your hand and say, I'll walk with you. Come on. Say, lead me, Holy Spirit. Say, I surrender. I surrender. I surrender all. Thank you, Jesus. I surrender to you, Father. Have your good and perfect way in me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Do whatever you want to do. Forgive us, Father, for making it about anything else. Forgive us for even putting this heavy weight on other people. Forgive us for being ones that have made the decision to, to actually be the, the, the taskmasters to these requirements. Forgive us for pointing our fingers and judging other individuals. 
to keep them to these strict requirements that have nothing to do with you. Help us, Father, to see you as you are. Help us to walk in the liberty and the freedom that you've designed for us. And at the same time, be submitted, willfully submitted to your will and your way. Clean our hearts, God. Restore our minds, Jesus. Help us be more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Come on in this room. Let's give a shout to the king. Come on. Lose your mind. Come on. Lose your mind. Literally lose your mind. That's what this message is doing. You're being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Come on. Open up your mouth in this place. You're being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. It's always been about relationships.